Well, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for being with us today. Of course, this is Legal Talk. I am your host, John Mitchell, and we're glad to have everybody in the audience out there with us today. And we're going to bring you some great information that you're going to be able to use, and uh, it'll be really useful. Take action, uh, as you will. And uh, of course, we have with us today, Ms. Robin Grain, who is a divorce mediator extraordinaire. Robin has been in the uh, divorce mediation business exclusively since about 2009. And uh, she is based out of the state of Virginia in the uh, uh, DC area. So uh, great, uh, great having Robin with us today. We appreciate it. And so Robin, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here again. Yes, ma'am. Hey, well, we have a wonderful next up question that's uh, burning on everybody's mind. Uh, and that question is, what steps can business owners take if they want to protect themselves and protect their business mm. interests during uh, and before, before and during a divorce? Well, <laughs> makes me feel like I'm back in Chicago where I cut my teeth as a young divorce attorney uh, specializing in small businesses. Uh, if you if you are serious about settling the case, if you're that if that's where this thing's headed, and not everybody can settle their case, believe me, I know. But if you're serious about settling your case, you're not going to be thinking in terms of protecting yourself from your spouse. Lots of times, you don't need to protect yourself from your spouse. If you need to protect yourself, then protect yourself. Get an attorney and come up with a strategy. If you don't, though, and you're moving toward doing actions that protect yourself, such as moving assets around to protect them, it looks sketchy and you might get treated as if you are sketchy, even if you're not. In other words, if you just are, are paranoid uh, and start doing the classics, which is uh, sometimes an attorney might tell you, you know, take money out of any account that the other person could get to, take at least half of it out and put it somewhere safe, for example. Uh, it doesn't look good. It doesn't feel good to the other person. It can make everybody nervous. It can ramp up litigation, but that's, but that's something that some people do. So if you feel you need to really protect yourself, okay, back to that. Uh, you need to start early, okay? In other words, if all of a sudden divorce is in the air because you're because you've not been getting along at all, and you can kind of feel that, it, that you're towards the end, don't wait until you're towards the end and start working with an attorney, which is what I would recommend, not a mediator. If you feel you need to protect yourself, you work with an attorney. Do it before the marriage falls apart. Otherwise, whatever divorce financial planning that you do is going to look like you're trying to hide the money. So that's one piece of advice. Start early. The other is definitely have an attorney. If it was me and I was trying to protect myself from my spouse, because they were a very, very bad spouse and I needed to protect myself, I wouldn't stop at the attorney. I would also want a forensic accountant. And I would make sure that my attorney had respect for that forensic accountant and vice versa. So I would have a team of me, my forensic accountant, and my lawyer to look at my books, to look at how I run my business and view it from the other side. In other words, I would ask my attorney and my forensic accountant to view it as if they were scrutinizing me, right? So it's right. sort of like, it's almost like reverse psychology, but for, but for litigation attorneys. Right. And to see where the holes are. Let's say I knew that I wanted a divorce and I was kind of holding back the, my revenue, you know, I was kind of just holding it back. It's okay, you can pay me on the uh, whatever plan for a year, which people do. Not, I mean, it's hard to get away with now. With digital records, it's hard to get away with anything. But let's just say I was doing bad stuff. I would want a forensic accountant to look at it and say, hey, this doesn't look good. And this isn't where the big guns are. The big guns are over here. You see what I'm saying? So I would want people smarter than me to help me strategize. And those people smarter than me would be a very strategically oriented attorney, not an attorney that's all about settlement. So I'd look in the community 
for an attorney that's known to be financially savvy and strategical, and I would want that attorney to recommend a forensic accountant that they thought was awesome. And I would get out my big, huge checkbook because it would be costing me a fortune. Yes, right? yes, hiring lawyers planning. is very expensive. So we know It's like doing two cases, right? You're protecting your business, you're protecting yourself. It's like at least 1.5 divorce cases. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it sure does. That is okay. great information. Uh, so w that's one of the important things I heard you say there. Get with an attorney that's got a good reputation in the community and make sure that that lawyer knows the forensic accountant and can go ahead and recommend right. that forensic accountant right. for you. You don't uh, just want an attorney that has a good reputation in the community because good reputation for a lawyer can also mean that they're excellent at sitting down and negotiating and settling. And if you are literally in a position where you feel that your spouse is going to come after your business and you're trying to protect your business, right? That was the operative language, protect your business. You want an attorney that's strategical. I mean, right now here in where I practice, I can send you to you know, attorneys that are really, really good at settling, but they're not necessarily the ones that I would send you to if I, you needed a litigator that would blow your doors off. They're not necessarily the same people. Does that make sense? It's different yes. personalities. Do yeah, different yeah. Types of... yeah, we've all got our fortes. And, uh, right, you know, speaking right. about settling versus litigating, I mean, I don't know about you, you, Robin, but when I went to law school, they taught me that a bad settlement is better than a good lawsuit seven days a week. So, you know, yeah. be, be, uh, be aware out there. You, you, can, yeah. you, can, you can fight over, I've seen this, and you can fight over the smallest little details and spend an inordinate amount of money in legal fees uh, and just get to the place where you basically right. were gonna end up in the first place. So that's gonna yeah. be uh, you know, an important thing to, to remember for everybody. Uh, which brings up an important thing. Let me ask you this question, and uh, I know your experience is gonna just blow the doors off this answer and you're gonna knock it out of the park. Mark. What about <laughs> prenuptial or postnuptial <laughs> agreements? How can that affect uh, the division of the business assets in a divorce context? Can you say the first part again? Yeah, uh, prenuptial or postnuptial agreements. Mm -hmm. You know, how might how might that work, and how might that affect your d division of assets? Right. That depends on how good the drafter of the prenuptial agreement was in both paying attention to the laws of the state and doing what that agreement was put in place for. So for example, if there was a prenuptial agreement and the non-moneyed party, because it's usually a moneyed party and a non-moneyed party, if the non-moneyed or lesser moneyed party didn't get that information until a week before the wedding, here, sign here, even if they were presented with the information, that might be a little bit, you know, too close in time. So you're going to have to hire somebody that knows the laws of the state and make sure that you don't step out of bounds with that prenuptial agreement that it's too close in time to the wedding. That there was the two things were it's too close in time. It's duress, duress. Essentially, it's duress. Which if a con if you sign a contract under duress, sometimes it can become invalid. So you don't want the duress. And the other thing is non-disclosure. Most states, if not all states, but I don't know the law in all states, but you need a certain amount of disclosure. Basically, you need to disclose everything. So no surprises. If you're ask, so asking somebody to sign away their rights, now, of course, as the business grows, that prenuptial agreement better be written. <sighs> you got to have somebody really smart. It's got, you have to have a combination of it written really tight so it's not overturnable but not so tight that the non-business owner is going to be living on the street. A court will find a way to have a spouse not live under the closest bridge on the interstate. They're just not going to leave somebody destitute. They're going to find a way, which might possibly be, if it's written so tight, there's no way around non-business owner spouse getting a piece of the action of that business. Perhaps that spouse is going to get more of the marital property. So maybe goodbye to the equity in the house. But 
But if there's a business worth a decent amount of money, you can be sure that the spouse is, the non-business owning spouse is either gonna get a piece of that business or is gonna get more of the marital assets. But uh, I'm not a fan of postnuptial agreements. So if you wanna go down that path, you know, at some point we, we can. Uh, the prenups in my office, if you come into my office with a prenup, there has, and this is my, my role, I'm sure there's other mediators like me, you have to decide whether you're going to enforce it 100% or not. I do not allow people to cafeteria pick around. We're going to have pick some of it, pick, and we're just going to argue. Where they're going to determine, first we're going to determine whether you agree it's valid. If you agree it's valid, we have to say, are we going to enforce it? In which case, they don't usually need me as a mediator, because most attorneys can draft a prenup. So that you know you just apply it um but but most of my clients all of my clients out with prenups have decided just to set it aside and they go with what's fair so it made them feel good at the time but then they wanted to do something a little different they're fraught with difficulty prenups postnups you might as well say recipe for litigation my wow. old boss used to love them when they came in the door he thought they were fun they were like a sport for him yeah, well, that is, you know what? That is great, uh, great information for everybody. Uh, and so let me just uh, wrap it up because uh, we got to cut to commercials and we're going to ask you to go ahead and let everybody out there know if you are looking for uh, the best, uh, best of the best divorce mediator out there, uh, how in the world would people get in touch with you, Robin? The, the people want to know. Super easy. You can pick up the phone and call me. I will answer your call in turn. Everybody gets a return call within 24 hours, sometimes 48, 571-220-1998. Or you can just go to my website, grain, G-R-A-I-N-E, mediation.com. And there's a contact form there. You can get in touch with me that way. You can sign up for a free 15-minute consult. Or like I said, you can just pick up the phone. Uh, you can go on YouTube and leave a comment and I'll be sure to <laughs> respond back to that too. That's also great mediation. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that information, Robin. And uh, thanks to the audience for being with us. And we will be uh, back after some uh, commercial breaks. <laughs> 